Welcome to Retina Health for Life from the President's Corner, brought to you by the American Society of Retina Specialists. I'm your host, Dr. Tim Murray, coming to you from Miami. On each episode, we'll bring you inspiring conversations about your sight and the special role the retina plays in making healthy vision possible. We'll hear from expert retina specialists, as well as directly from patients about living life to the fullest with retinal disease. Join us and learn how to safeguard your retina health for life. Welcome to the ASRS's Retina Health for Life from the President's Corner. Tonight, we're going to talk about sports safety for retina health with our special guests. It's my pleasure to introduce my friend and colleague, a very special senior retina specialist, Dr. Harry Flynn from the Bascom Palmer Eye Institute at the University of Miami. With Dr. Flynn, I'm going to have the opportunity to talk with Landon Rowitz. So it's really my pleasure to welcome you both as two special guests to our show. Welcome, Harry. Tim, thank you very much. It's a great honor and privilege for me to be part of this program. I've had a special interest in sports injuries for my entire career, dating back to a time when I got hit in the eye with a tennis ball. That really spiked my interest in this subject. And together with Dr. Rowitz, we put together a series of uh, slides and cases of ocular injuries associated with sports, with particular interest in the retina and the posterior part of the eye, because people don't think about the things that can happen with these ball injuries. So Dr. Rowitz, first of all, congratulations on choosing retina. I think Harry and I would tell you the, the best field as you go forward. Um, but can you tell me what brought your interest into evaluating um, sports-related ocular trauma? Yeah, th thank you so much for having me, Dr. Murray. Um, you know, growing up, I played a lot of sports, uh, football, baseball, uh, basketball. And um, I saw, you know, a lot of injuries uh, by fellow teammates and um, I thought that was something that uh, kind of drew me to this project. Um, and then at uh, Bascom Palmer in the ER, we see a lot of sports-related retinal injuries. And um, I just developed a particular interest in that uh, field. And so I thought it'd be um, interesting and, and worthwhile to pursue um, kind of a, a review of uh, this topic. Well, I think it's interesting because I think the three of us are strong proponents of, of an active lifestyle, particularly in sports. And sports, as we know, can have health benefits that are extensive at virtually every age in life. But I think that Dr. Flynn has alluded to the fact that some of these sports, particularly these ball injury associated sports or heavy physical sports, puts our eye at risk. So Dr. Flynn, first, you had suggested um, that you were able to put a series together with Landon that focused on ocular trauma. Can you give me a little bit of an idea of, of how you pulled those first patient numbers together and what that meant for you? Well, we looked at the existing literature and there are two important papers, one from JAMA Ophthalmology that looked at emergency department registry of ocular injuries. And this involved uh, approximately 30,000 ocular injuries in, reported in emergency room data. And of that number, many of these were posterior segment. The exact percentage was 2.4% involved the retina or the back part of the eye. A second one occurred in an electronic national survey and involved 5,000 sports-related injuries in emergency departments. And again, this was a big series involving all types of uh, sports injuries. This involved a, a variety of injuries, uh, including football, uh, basketball, baseball, tennis, etc. And Dr. Rowitz will perhaps comment on some of those specifics. So Landon, tell us a little bit about what are the sports as Dr. Flynn has begun to discuss are most associated with retinal injury, not just globe injury. 
A common sport that causes retinal injury is um, soccer, actually, surprisingly. You know, it's it's not as popular in the United States, but definitely uh, internationally, you see a lot of injuries. And contrary to popular belief, um, the soccer ball is actually able to mold against the eye and um, impact the globe. And this causes compressive injury um, that can lead to retinal injury. Um, baseball and basketball uh, can also cause injury, but uh, as you kind of alluded to, these are more frequently involving the superficial aspects um, around the eye or the orbital bones um, because these are larger balls that don't as easily um, strike the globe. Um, other sports that are frequently implicated include racket sports. Um, these in involve you know, high-speed projectiles that can strike the eye accidentally, and these include um, tennis, racquetball, pickleball. Pickleball is of particular interest recently as it's grown in popularity and the injury can occur either from uh, one's partner um, with the ball hitting the eye or um, the partner uh, partner's paddle hitting the eye or um, a direct impact from the opponent. And then um, another uh, frequent cause of um, retinal injury are golf balls and then paintballs. Um, these are, you know, small, very high speed projectiles and uh, it's rare to have an injury um, from these. Uh, but when we do have an injury, it's uh, frequently devastating, um, including ruptured globes, um, retinal detachments, given the high uh, impact, high, high force. I'd like to just put in a, a little uh, plug for Dr. Rowitz, who uh, was the first author in a study of retinal dialyses and the major cause was soccer related injuries. We had a series of 60 patients with dialyses where a large number of these patients had a history of soccer injuries, frequently in younger patients who may uh, try to uh, create a header and they miss and it hits them directly in the eye. And that blunt force can cause a retinal dialysis, which is a type of retinal detachment. It's always been interesting to me that the most common worldwide um, sport with ocular injury is badminton. So mm -hmm. you, who would have thought that badminton would be, would be the deadly sport that it seems to be for the eye? Yes. Um, to, to, so Dr. Flynn, tell me, um, do, P, do these um, injuries present acutely or do you see the patients after the injury in a delayed fashion? Um, and, and what are the symptoms that might be associated with a significant injury? Pain is one symptom. If there's a corneal abrasion or contusion of the lids, they can present with pain and swelling. Uh, for retinal injuries, there may be less symptoms. They may have flashes or floaters. They may have a visual field deficit. Or in the case of dialyses, they may have no symptoms until they present later. It could be a month or two or more later that the retinal detachment progresses to become symptomatic within the posterior part of the eye. So, Dr. Rowe, would you often see many of these patients through the emergency room at Bascom Palmer? Um, I'm assuming that when they come in, it's usually an acute injury. What, what do you think we should tell the the our patients, before there are patients that are sports active, what, what should they be looking for? What type of injury should they be concerned about? Are there symptoms that are important for them to know? Certainly, like uh, Dr. Flynn alluded to, uh, decreased vision, uh, you know, persistently decreased vision after an injury is a, a worrisome sign. Um, you know, other frequent um, symptoms are flashes of light. Um, so, you know, little flashes of light in the periphery, um, maybe signs of an impending um, retinal tear or an existing retinal tear. Um, floaters can also be uh, worrisome. So new floaters in a patient who didn't have them before or an increase in floaters in someone who previously had them. And these appear as, you know, small specks or um, little little spots uh, that can be various colors, including red in the, in the um, setting of vitreous hemorrhage. And then distorted vision as well uh, can be seen. And then um, also like a dark uh, curtain or a shadow uh, can be signs of a retinal attachment and should be evaluated immediately. 
So Dr. Flynn, when, when these patients present to you, what are the testing um, protocols that you use? What, what imaging do you do? And then how do you assess what to do with the patient that you see? Well, first of all, I think they should have a complete eye exam, including visual acuity, intraocular pressure, evaluation of the external part of the eye, including the lids, lashes, cornea, and conjunctiva. And uh, if those parts of the eye are normal, then we proceed to the posterior segment and we look at the vitreous, we look at the optic nerve and macula and the peripheral retina. If I see evidence of posterior segment injury, then I like to perform uh, wide field color photography uh, to really uh, document the status of the mid peripheral and peripheral retina, as well as uh, an OCT of the macula to look at uh, the integrity and the status of the fovea and surrounding structures. Uh, in kids, we can see a condition called commotio retinae, which is swelling of the retina uh, so that the retina looks white uh, from the contusion damage to the retinal surface. And uh, we can also occasionally see a macular hole. Uh, in children, fortunately, this hole can be deceptive. It, it uh, spontaneously closes in at least 30% of these kids with an early macular hole. So the management strategy is observation and watch the child because, again, they can get better by themselves. By contrast, retinal detachment or a dialysis does not get better by itself. And those are patients that may be candidates for surgery, depending on the extent and the, and the uh, severity of the uh, injury. So Dr. Flynn, one of the things I think you did emphasize was a comprehensive exam. And for, for both our patients, and, and I'm sure for Dr. Rowe, it's, that's a dilated examination where right. we enlarge the pupil so that we can see as much as possible. Right. And the other thing is sometimes these uh, patients have had injuries around the lid and they're very difficult to examine. Right. And if I can't get the complete exam, I often think about using ultrasound um, to let me see in and around the eye as, as an adjunct to this. Yes. Um, do you have any thoughts on, on ultrasound for trauma? I think it's very important. It's a tool that we don't use on every patient, but there are selected patients where we uh, have an uncooperative child or a, uh, a patient that just can't uh, cooperate because of the pain, and it, it does help. Dr. Rowitz, when you see these patients in the emergency room at Bascom Palmer, you're blessed to have full imaging capabilities. I'm assuming that you get wide field imaging on almost every patient with ocular trauma. Is that correct? Yeah. Uh, it, you know, it's nice to document um, the findings so that we can uh, track them throughout their course and kind of compare them uh, at future visits. Uh, to the initial visit. Yeah, I'm a big believer in the in the imaging, um, even to show that there is no abnormality. Um, Dr. Flynn, there's a little bit of a controversy after an injury like this. If there, if you don't see any evidence of acute trauma, what's your follow up schedule for these patients, and and what are you looking for? Well, I think uh, I generally like to see them back within a month or so after the injury, and there may be evidence of a. Uh, a dislocated lens, or there may be some other peripheral retinal finding that uh, you could not identify on the first examination, either due to swelling or lack of cooperation. So there are things that you can pick up later uh, on subsequent examinations. And I think it's just good to maintain continuity with the patient and to uh, really put everything down to document their status. I think that's true. Dr. Rowitz, if you see the patient and there's not clear posterior segment trauma, but there is some anterior segment inflammatory alterations, how do you manage those patients and when do you see them back? Frequently we see patients with like a traumatic iritis, you know, where there's no obvious um, injury um, 
to the structures necessarily in the anterior segment or in the posterior segment, uh, but the patients have you know inflammation from uh, the the injury itself. Uh, so frequently these can be managed uh, with topical steroids and uh, topical cycloplegic, such as atropine or cyclopentylate. Um, and generally these patients do very well. The, the inflammation resolves on its own. And I generally see these patients back in a week. Harry and I really get the focus on retina, but you're actually looking at that patient comprehensively. And I think it's important for our patients and their families to know that we do treat if there is an injury, a traumatic inflammatory injury, and it is important to follow very closely. So, so Dr. Flynn, um, in your series with the most common uh, injuries, what was your most common approach to manage a complex retinal detachment from trauma? Well, you have to look at a number of factors. Is it a dialysis or a giant retinal tear? There's a difference. Dialysis means a separation of the insertion of the peripheral retina towards the anterior part of the eye. A giant retinal tear is much more serious and that involves a tear in within the substance of the retina and it may become uh, quickly and scar tissue develops to cause a severe total retinal detachment. Whereas dialyses tend to be very slowly progressive and you have time to observe for a while before surgery. With giant retinal tears, and I've seen a number of these from baseball injuries, uh, those I, I tend to operate on early uh, usually within a few days of the injury in order to uh, get them repaired. I guess the other issue is what do you manage to do for the patient going forward? Uh, you know, if a patient is already wearing glasses, I say you need to get into safety glasses. If they have one eye that's very poor or has been damaged, but they want to continue in sports, then I believe that uh, safety uh, goggle protective wear is very important for those people going forward. And I think uh, kind of common sense, uh, if you're around a, a wall where people are hitting tennis balls hard and their balls going everywhere, that's the person that you want, you want to hide from that situation. You want to be careful around situations that could result in an ocular injury. Dr. Owens, going to um, back to you, it's been interesting to me that you would think that the professionals would be more likely to have severe injury. But in my experience, the pickup, you know, basketball game is is more fraught with a risk of injury than a professional playing in the NBA. Um, so how do you assess risk and then how do you have that discussion? Let's have you tell me what you do with your adult patients. And then I'm going to push you, Dr. Flynn, with what we do when the families ask us that question for their kids. Amateurs playing sports are more prone to developing an injury just because, um, you know, they may not be as aware of, uh, you know, the rules of the game and they may not be um, as coordinated, uh, frankly, and a lot of these uh, professional players are, have been playing the sport for years. Um, they know uh, the protective um, means to, to employ, and they, they're, you know, they're frankly very good a athletes, and they have um, coordination and very uh, high uh, hand-eye coordination skills. Um, you know, frequently we see injuries in children because of that reason, um, you know, uh, like in soccer, you can think about, um, you know, kids kick the ball and um, they are not able to react quickly enough um, to miss the ball. Um, for adults, I think it's important um, to be mindful, like Dr. Flynn mentioned, um, in patients who have uh, one, a history of eye trauma, um, you know, this is an indication that they're more prone to undergo future eye trauma. And then uh, two, patients with a history of eye disease in general. So be that they're a monocular for whatever reason, or um, you know they have some sort of underlying eye issue. I think it's uh, very important to try to uh, encourage these patients to uh, use protective eyewear. 
you and I both see complex retinal patients um, that are pediatric and with often their families. And every single mom is like, he plays, he plays football, can he go back and play again? Um, so you've suggested that the level of injury, the level of function, and at a minimum protective eyewear at all times. Are there times when you suggest potentially that a child shouldn't go back to a sports activity or are there sports activities that you think should be avoided? Some sports, uh, there are rules that protect people. For example, racquetball, handball, uh, and many of these uh, institutions that have courts like that there's mandatory uh, goggle protective eyewear in order to play that. So that's uh, the public uh, using common sense to protect each other. And I think really that prevention is the key. And if the parents of a child are educated and understand that they, there are certain activities that they should perhaps try to avoid, such as uh, fooling around and uh, paintball uh, type activities where they may have paint on the mask, they lift the mask and that's when there are uh, other people there who shoot directly in the face. I think that would be a good activity to give up uh, if, if an eye has had a ser serious injury. The other thing I've learned, Harry, is you've got to ask what sport we're talking about. I had a child that had um, been seen uh, by the oculoplastic service at Baskin Palmer and had to have one of the eyes removed. And then the second eye, the only eye was injured. And they were like, well, can we go back to sports? And, I'm, and I was thinking, I don't think that's a good idea, but I was um, lucky enough to say, well, what sports? And they were a mixed martial artist. So they were having, you know, head and eye trauma virtually every practice and certainly in competition. So I was like, could you take up chess? <laughs> yeah, I think that's a good point. I think, again, prevention is the key element here. And just common sense about the risk of the activity, but discussing that openly and honestly with the, with the parents and with the patient is important. And then Harry, I think that um, Landon probably is aware of this, but I, the best example I've seen of the impact of protective sportswear was the Canadian um, hockey experience where they mandated protective eyewear in, in their junior hockey leagues. And the, and the injury rate went to zero for vision compromising injury. So. It's, it's clear that, that common sense is important and protective eyewear makes a difference. So that's my big emphasis also when I see these, um, the kids and the adults. Exactly, I, I fully agree. And you know, it may be a little awkward at the beginning to wear protective goggles, but certainly going forward, uh, especially in the patient with reduced vision in one eye, uh, to protect that good eye is, is very important. The other thing that I talk a little bit about is there's a big push, at least when I see these, these younger athletes, to get out of eyeglasses. They want to be in contact lenses. Um, and of course, we're in, all in Miami and South Florida, which to me seems to be the contact lens related infection capital of the world. So you'll notice I'm still wearing my glasses. And so I push hard for for glasses as opposed to contacts for their activities. Um, and sometimes I've even had to talk to the team coach who's pushing the kid to go into contact lenses where I'm like, I, I'd really rather they not. Landon, what do you do with kids that are playing soccer? You alluded to that as an injury with heading the ball. So if you've had a concussive injury to the globe, um, what do you tell them? Actually, when I was a, a child, I had a concussion, a bad concussion. and um, my parents didn't let me uh, head the ball uh, after that. So, um, you know, it's, it's one of those things where you have to have a discussion with the parents. Um, they, ha they have to be aware of the real risk of their being in an eye injury or, I mean, as well as a head injury too, uh, from heading, um, because it is a, 
a dangerous activity where you can, you know, hit the you you can have an injury from the ball, but also from another player's head. Um, and so I think it's ultimately it's up to the parent and the patient. Um, but I think the most important thing is you can do is inform uh, parents and patients, um, and doing sorts of things like this um, to increase public awareness, and, and you know potentially eventually down the line change um, rules and guidelines as you alluded to with the Canadian um, hockey experiment. As we move to wrap things up, Harry, what would you look for for take-home messages to our listeners and and particularly maybe to our parents? I think uh, awareness of the uh, frequency of uh, ocular injuries, including injuries to the retina and the optic nerve and the posterior part of the eye are uh, not rare. And uh, these injuries can impact the future lives of young people and can be a devastating uh, lifetime problem. So I think uh, common sense in terms of activities that are appropriate and not appropriate is important. As I say, when I go by the tennis courts and I see 10 kids lined up in a small hitting wall and the ball's flying around everywhere. I get nervous and uh, it bothers me to see that situation, which is a setup for somebody getting hit in the eye. And I think the other thing is uh, if the child is are already wearing glasses, that'd be ideal for them to go into safety glasses, goggles that are appropriately recommended by the manufacturer for that particular activity. And uh, then just uh, common sense if an injury does occur to seek uh, ophthalmic consultation uh, and uh, that way to rule out or catch an injury early so that appropriate treatment can be given and limit the long-term devastation of that injury. And then, Harry, I'm a big proponent, um, and Landon, I wonder your comments to tell my patients, if you have an injury and you're worried enough to have an exam and your eye is not dilated, if they don't put drops in to dilate your pupil, that you should make sure that you're seen by someone who will do that. Because I'm shocked at how many times someone potentially is seen but doesn't have a complete exam and has peripheral injury that goes unrecognized. Any thoughts? Landon, what about you? Are you guys dilating everybody in the ER? Yeah, yeah. We dilate every patient who comes in the ER. Um, I completely agree. It's not really um, a complete exam without um, being able to dilate and look to the posterior half of the eye. So um, I'm completely uh, in agreement with you there. I think the advantage uh, of the wide field cameras, even in a child who can get reasonably good pictures, and it's certainly a lot better than no examination. You cannot do scleral depression in a child, but you can at least get a glance of the posterior segment. And with the camera, you can get a pretty good look at the mid periphery and close to the periphery. And for me also in those cases where I'm thinking, do I have to go to the operating room and look with anesthesia? I'll try to use ultrasound with the wide field imaging and try to see if I can spare an examination with anesthesia in the operating room for, for the child. Harry, let, let, as we wrap up, I think one of the things that you've emphasized is that the outcomes for these traumatic injuries can be better than people sometimes believe. So what do you counsel your patients about in terms of expected vision and functional outcome after an injury? Do you segregate by the type of injury um, and individualize for the patient? Or do you have some general guidelines overall for your, your series? Well, I think I go over the findings from the examination uh, in the particular patient. And if I see a uh, commotio or swelling of the retina in the posterior part of the eye, I tell them that the prognosis is uncertain and they have to be followed because many of them will get better, but some of them will not and they'll have retinal atrophy or a macular hole. Uh, I, I think, uh, again, it depends on the particular case. 
uh, and it depends on the, the involvement of retinal detachment or not. As I mentioned, giant retinal tears have a particularly poor prognosis, and retinal dialyses, by contrast, have a very good prognosis. Those can be managed by scleral buckling without vitrectomy in most cases. Uh, so the surgery is limited as opposed to more advanced with giant tears. So I, I try to tailor the discussion to the findings on the examination, but I also emphasize that follow-up is important and we may detect other uh, abnormalities in future examinations that are related to the injury, but we cannot uh, fully detect them at the initial examination. Well, I'd like to thank both of you. I think that the, um, our listeners will be thrilled to have the opportunity to hear from our senior Bascom Palmer Redden Specialist and our soon-to-be uh, at Bascom Palmer Redden Specialist about ocular injuries, protective eyewear, how you should be examined, and then what we can expect for those injuries. So thank you, Dr. Flynn and Dr. Rowitz, for joining us on Redna Health for Life from the President's Corner. Thank you, Tim. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for tuning in to Redna Health for Life from the President's Corner. You can watch and listen to more episodes on the ASRS YouTube channel and on popular podcast directories, including Apple Podcast, Google Podcast, and Spotify. For even more information about safeguarding your vision for a lifetime, visit asrs.org slash patients and follow ASRS on both Facebook and Twitter. Retina Health for Life is made possible in part through generous support from the Foundation of the American Society of Retina Specialists, Allergan, Genentech, Novartis, and Regeneron Pharmaceuticals. See you soon.